Jeannie Ives, thanks for joining us on the Illinois Channel. It's been a long time, and it's great to see you again. Oh, thank you for having me on your show. This is wonderful, doing it from my home in Wheaton. Yeah, it's, uh, it, it's great because uh, a lot of people obviously know that you were a member of the legislature until the end of the year, but m more importantly, they certainly remember that you ran for governor against uh, Governor Rauner and came within an eyelash of defeating him. And I would argue, and I know this to be true from my own talking to Republicans around the state, that a lot of people still want to hear what Jeannie Ives has to say because they will argue, uh, I'll make an argument for you, and just say that they say other Republicans are not making the case for the Republican cause as affirmatively as these Republican voters want it to be made. And they say, that's what they really respected about Jeannie Ives, that she was very firm in her convictions and would make a solid argument. So with that in mind, uh, I wanted to well, follow I, up. I don't understand. Yeah, I think, I, I, first of all, just a couple of remarks on that. I, I think that that's part of your duty as a legislator is to actually take the care and, and care enough about what's going on to make arguments so that other people can understand the context of, of what's being said and, 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 and everything. And, it, you know, uh, you can't just be a backbencher. You can't just sit down. You have to ask uh, the right questions and, and, and get all the information out possible. And uh, so that, I always just felt like that was part of my responsibility. And, and I appreciate that. And I was going to say the thing is, uh, Let's, well, we just, as a quick review, had a momentous uh, spring session of legislature with uh, the biggest budget ever passed. It's uh, right at about roughly $40 billion. We had the largest capital bill ever passed. We're awaiting that to be signed into law, but that's around $45 billion. I was personally guessing it was going to be $35 billion. Then it was announced at $41.5 billion. And by the time they're all done, they added another $3.5 billion. So we're roughly at $45 billion. They passed uh, an expansion of abortion. They passed recreational marijuana. So I'm sure you probably have some uh, real thoughts on all of those. Let's start off just quickly with the budget. What is your overall assessment of the budget that was passed? And anything you want to add on that? Well, the first thing that your viewers should know about the budget is, is that they never, they don't, it's obviously not balanced. First of all, they never accepted a revenue number. They never came together in a bipartisan way and said, look, um, COGFA says we have $38.965 billion to spend. And um, the governor's budget group says we have X amount of money to spend. And so we're going to decide how much money we really have to spend. The truth is that they only have about $39 billion that was going to come in. And that includes the windfall that they like to say that they got from uh, the $1.5 billion that came in in extra April receipts. They like to say that, uh, well, we got this extra money, we're gonna spend it now. Well, that was included in the $39 billion figure. But instead, when they come back to spend, they came back to spend $40.6 billion was the final budget number. Eight, something like that. So it was over $40.6 billion that they're spending, way above the revenue estimate. So the, the idea that this is balanced at all is ludicrous. On top of it, they underfunded the pension payments. If you look at how they should be funded on an actuarial basis, they underfunded it by $5 billion additional. Uh, and they put nothing uh, aside really to pay off back bills that's significant. $200 million is not significant when you owe over a six and a half billion dollars in back bill. So the budget's massively unbalanced and, um, and it just continues the trend that we've had for the last 18 years. Now we're at 19 years of unbalanced budgets. I want to get your thoughts on a, a number of these other issues I mentioned, but uh, sure. how frustrating, since you were now no longer a member of the government, how frustrating was it for you to be watching this happening, these events and not to be part of that process, or was it coincidentally maybe less frustrating by not being part of that process? I find it frustrating only because I, I think that speaking up on the House floor has power, and I, I didn't see a lot of my colleagues speaking up as powerfully as they should have on some of the issues. 
Um, and I think I thought it was really unfortunate that there was actually Republican votes on the budget. Uh, they should have never agreed to that at all. Sorry, just lost my microphone. Um, so, I mean, there's there were problems wholesale about all of that. And, you know, I, I guess it is frustrating not being down there, not having that voice on the House floor and in committee uh, and finally finding things out on the backside instead of in real time. I can imagine you're you're not in favor of the uh, I can imagine you're not in favor Sorry. of the abortion expansion that you were probably not in favor of the recreational marijuana. I'll let you say, you know, was there any one of these issues that you were more adamant against than let's say, I mean, let's divide it first. There's the economic mm -hmm. issues and there's the social issues. Let's talk about the social issues that were being voted on. We had the effort to try to jack up the requirements on the FOID card. We had the expansion of recreational marijuana. We had the expansion of abortion. Were there any one of those issues that you were especially charged on uh, or felt were egregious or were they each uh, things that you took uh, quite exception to? Oh, for sure. The abortion bill is just, it, it, it's inconceivable that you had legislators cheering on the House floor, high-fiving each other, having an entire celebration when Governor Pritzker signed the most extreme abortion bill in the, in the, in the United States at this point. I mean, why would you celebrate the government of children that are fully developed? They're fully developed human beings. The, the destruction, the celebratory nature over the destruction of human life is outrageous. And here's the other thing. Our side, our side that's pro-life, look, we weren't filing legislation to do a heartbeat bill. We've seen it in another, a number of other states. We weren't filing legislation that says that all of these uh, abortion clinics had to be inspected on a regular basis. We weren't filing legislation that um, gave them higher standards for, for practice at all. And, and they didn't have to do this. We already are the abortion capital of the Midwest. This just makes it more uh, more definitive that way. Um, we weren't doing hardly anything to move it to our side of the aisle. We were just basically trying to hold the status quo. And instead, they had to put in such extreme abortion la language. You can kill a human being up th that's nine months, uh, you know, that's just uh, the day of their birth, the day of their birth. You take off one limb, then the other limb. You cut the body up. I mean, it, 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 it's gruesome. It's gruesome. And the fact that they, they were celebrating the destruction of human life, which, by the way, is the destruction of human potential. I, I, I don't understand it. <clears throat> yeah, I don't know if it uh, came, the news filtered up, but the, uh, the Bishop of Springfield actually uh, now came out and prohibited Speaker Madigan and Senate President Cullerton, both Catholics, from receiving communion in the Springfield Archdiocese because of their support of the abortion bill. Um, I haven't heard their reaction. Maybe they're not caring since they don't live in the Springfield Archdiocese, but uh, at least the Catholic Church Authority in Springfield did react to the passage of the bill in that manner. Uh, on the, uh, on the uh, other issues, let, let's, let's say on the economic issues, uh, did you have any, a lot of people on both sides of the aisle said we needed a capital bill um, and that it had been 10 years. And as the governor pointed out, Governor Pritzker pointed out that, and I think rightfully so, that even the last capital bill, which was in 09, Governor Rauner cut short the implementation of that uh, which might be a good thing. I mean, I think he was trying to manage the dollars and all, but um, the point is, as sure. Governor Pritzker was saying, it was not only 10 years ago they passed a bill, but that that bill had not been fully implemented, meaning that we had a lot more capital requirements than one would otherwise have. With that as a setup, uh, mm -hmm. and if you had any thoughts on the capital bill per se. 
Well, first of all, the capital bill this year is 50% um, higher than the capital bill in 2009. So last then they passed about a $31 billion capital bill that was going to be appropriated over the course of the years. And they knew that this was going to happen over a, a time frame of about five years. Um, and then this bill, though, $45 billion, you know, that's that's 50% greater than the one prior to that. And we are even further in debt in terms of our pension obligations our unfunded retiree health care. The state is is just drowning in debt and they added more debt. And, and then, and also the capital bill, I mean, it's gonna be paid with massive tax increases. And so the, the biggest one, of course, is the gas tax, which is a regressive tax. It hurts the poor and the middle class the most because uh, it, gas is universal. People have to drive places. Um, and, it, you know, it, and at the same time, the Democrats want a progressive tax where you tax the rich more they passed a massive gas tax, doubling it all in one year. So there was the problem with the capital bill here, there was actually no moderation in it. There's tons of um, political pork in this capital bill, things that are 100% unnecessary. I'm sorry, but you know what, when the state is broke like this, we do not need to be, have the state giving out park grants for water slide parks. Uh, we don't need them building a one and a half million dollar park to celebrate the HIV and AIDS epidemic like they're doing. I mean, this is this is nonsense. Fix our roads, fill our potholes, you know, repair our bridges. Uh, but they, they didn't do that. They went wholesale, wild party time. Let's spend everything we have that we everything and more that we don't have. This is the ramifications of that spending bill are going to be felt for two generations from now. They're still going to be indebted from the, the, the spending that they did now. And on top of it, they're never going to get the revenue out of the gas tax that they think they're going to get because, you know, there's a lot of folks that live very near the border and they are going to just buy their gas on the other side. I was talking today, coincidentally, uh, in bringing that up to uh, uh, one of the lobbyists for the uh, I'll say the gas station owners, it's the Illinois Petroleum mm -hmm. Marketers Association, but they have members who are gas station owners across the state. And, mm -hmm. uh, you know, I was said that they just feel like uh, they've been run over by a steam engine, that uh, they, you know, they had their minimum wage pushed to 20 right. to $15 an hour. So their, mm -hmm. their labor has just been doubled. You just right. doubled the gas tax with, by 19 cents a gallon, and then we're going to apply a sales tax on top of that, so that the differential between a Missouri or an Iowa is going to be, it, it, it's going to vary, but where it was traditionally about a 10 cents to 15 cents a gallon cheaper in those other states, it now could be 40 or 50 cents per gallon less, and and some of these gas station owners just feel like while they've been in business, I was told, for over 50 years in some cases, they really right. don't know that they're going to be now able to survive because of the anticipation that they're looking at of how much their business is going to fall off. And the third thing, and sure. maybe this isn't right. as dramatic, sure. but he says, you know, if, if we sell them gas, we want them now to come into the store and buy things. And you see that the gas stations are mm -hmm. many grocery stores these days. My local gas station also makes pizza. But um, we also added a dollar more to the uh, a pack of cigarettes. Now, I'm not a cigarette smoker, so I'd ask how much they are. But I was told, I was just taking some notes today, that the uh, the tax in Illinois is going to be two dollars and ninety eight cents for a pack, um, and in St. Louis it would be seventeen cents. So the differential on a carton is going right. to be like you know twenty or thirty dollars when you when you look at these costs. So people are going to you know to put twenty gallons of gas in their car and to buy a couple of packs of cigarettes, they literally would be saving forty or fifty dollars by driving across the border. I, you know, if you wanted to destroy a state's economy in one session, then you basically, they did everything that they possibly could do um, this year. So the threat of an increase in the income tax, uh, if, if people vote in the graduate income tax next year, that, that was step one, right? 
and that we're going to uh, now we're going to allow for recreational marijuana, which is going to bring a fraction of what it's really society in the long term. I mean, they've, they're already admitting that because they're using some of their the money that they get from selling drugs. You know, now they're going to use it for drug addiction. So they know that addiction is going is a problem right now, and it's going to have to be funded from this revenue they get from legal pot. I mean, but that's not good for for business owners, right? That's not good. They uh, they increase the minimum wage, like you said. Uh, they've increased the gas taxes. Uh, they've uh, they've increased additional business reg uh, regulations on business um, in, in terms of corporate stuff. Uh, for example, yeah, big corporations now have to have some sort of diversity panel or a diversity board. So I mean, they they just have doubled down on the bad stuff. In the meantime, that same gas station owner, the convenience store owner. Their prices, I, I guarantee you, are going up again next year. They're getting nothing, no relief on the property tax side. Um, they, they, they're going to continue to spend money on bloated pensions. Um, so there, there was absolutely nothing given back to the taxpayers for everything that occurred on the spend side. And, it, you know, this is a recipe for disaster for the state of Illinois. And we haven't... Uh had the opportunity to talk as much so I'm, uh, you and I uh, off camera were saying I mean we finally got this working out and we're so happy to be able to have you back right. on and I uh, said it won't hold you too much I could talk to you for much longer what I am looking forward to is that we can revisit with you from time to time but just before we close out uh, what what is the future in your estimation as you have been on the sidelines now for a little bit and you get a little different perspective i think than when you're in the capitol obviously so when you look at uh, the republicans in the house and the senate they've been kind of decimated their numbers they're fighting a rear guard action mm -hmm. <laughs> they don't have the votes to stop things uh what is the future of the republican party what or what should be done and to what extent i'm curious i know even after your campaign for governor ended, you were still being invited to speak at different organizations around the state. Is that still happening? And why don't we just kind of weave all that in together? Well, actually, I, I am speaking about 45 minutes away tonight to a group of Republicans that want to hear my perspective, I guess, on what's going on. Last week, I was in Rockford doing the same thing. So I appreciate the fact that people want to hear uh, my, my thoughts. And I think part of that is because um, I think some Republicans have a, mince their words. Now, fortunately, you've got a whole group of folks that have been pretty outspoken, even against Brady and Durkin, and took them to task for putting 10 votes on the budget in the House and 20 votes on the gas tax in the House as well. And uh, so you have Blaine Wilhauer and Chris Miller and Darren Bailey and Dan Calkins and Brad Holbrook and McSweeney and Cabello and... I think I'm missing a couple of folks. I think Andrew Chesney. I think you've got this whole group of folks that are willing to speak up now, but they, you know, a lot of them are freshmen. They hadn't seen how bad it was, and they understand now that leadership is important. And if Republican, the Republicans could lead on policy, and become united for uh, to the to represent taxpayers better, then I think that we could actually get something done in 2020. But I honestly don't see. I don't see that happening right now. I don't see a coherent plan to win the arguments and to actually make the argument people. Uh, it, it's unfortunate. We have a lot of in, uh, infrastructure needs in our party. A lot of build up has to happen. But I hope if the, the media does its job and explains to the public how bad the Pritzker's the first session was for our long-term health as a state, if the media does its job, hopefully a couple things happen in 2020. One, uh, we turn back some of the Democrats who voted for this excessive spending um, and medical marijuana and abortion on demand through all nine months paid for by taxpayers. We have to turn those people out of office and we have to defeat the income tax increase uh, that they, they are planning on making a constitutional amendment for. So if we can get that done, um, then I, I will have some hope for Illinois. If we are unable to wake up the electorate uh, when they when they just doubled your gas tax and gave themselves a pay raise, um, <laughs> I don't know what else to say. I mean, I don't know what else you can do. 
Well, Jeannie, as I say this, there's not going to be any shortage of issues that we can talk about over the uh, coming year and, and sometime after that. We want to have, and this is one reason why the Illinois Channel invested in this new technology and this software, we want to get the voices of Illinois from around the state, not just in Springfield, not just in Chicago, uh, and we appreciate you joining us from Wheaton. We know that your voice, your opinions are still valued, which is why, as I started off saying that, and as you just testified to it, that you're being invited to speak to these different groups. I know that is still the case. And so we always appreciate you taking the time to speak with us and sharing your thoughts. So uh, good luck to you. We hope that you're enjoying Thank maybe you. a little more time with your family these days than you had when you were in the state house. Um, and I hope your son I Joe, who I know broke his leg sadly <laughs> recently, yeah. that he's on the mend. He's, he's, you know, it hasn't impinged his social life at one bit. He's been to all the graduation parties. And so he's getting around. He's, he's going to be fine. Um, and we appreciate your thoughts on him. All right. Well, take care and uh, safe driving. Thank you. Okay.